Can you tell me a little bit more about Rosh Hashanah? So Rosh is head and Hashanah is the change or the year. So Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, the, the beginning of the change, really. In Jewish thinking, it's literally the birthday of the world. This is the day when it all begins and it all begins again. So every year you have the opportunity to begin again. So this coming year will be the year of 5782, 5782 in Jewish time. So we also have a very long historical view of time. We have a very different way of looking at it. How did they come upon that year as being year zero? How is it counted? So there are arcane ancient calculations really that I, that have to do with calendar systems, different calendar systems, because you know that Jewish time is also a, a solar lunar calendar. We are not, a, we are not entirely solar. We're not entirely lunar, but we have a, a, a different way of calculating time. And even for us, the day begins at night. So every day begins actually at sundown or after sundown. So we have the idea that because in Genesis, it was evening, it was morning, it was the first day. That's how, so to begin with, that's how we conceive of time. But second of all, we also say that we uh, have a day of, of a set aside day, a day of rest, right? And there, there were ancient rabbis who did all of the calculations about what year would all this have begun. And that's how they came up with the time frame. It's beyond me. I'm not mathematical. So I don't think I can explain it terribly well. But, you know, Judaism is, ne has never, ever been, uh, adverse to science ever. We didn't see a separation between uh, scientific understandings and spiritual understandings. So a lot of the ancient rabbis who were doing these cal these mathematical calculations, they were astronomers and astrologists even. They were uh, physicians. They had, a, at least in their day, they had a scientific bent and they did these incredible calculations about when did the world begin. And so that's how we have come up with this idea of what was year zero and where are we now? It's pretty remarkable, though, to think about. Um, we know from our calculations, we know how long Judaism has been around, which is a very, that's a pretty long time, right? We know that thousands of years ago, people were in some ways celebrating exactly the same holidays and exactly at exactly the same time in the lunar year. So we know that it's in the seventh month and the first day. And we, that's how, that's how we know when it's Rosh Hashanah. In the ancient world, when it was uh, Rosh Hashanah, for example, you know, you, people built bonfires on hillsides to let people know it was time, you know, coming forth from the temple in Jerusalem. Um, we still use, you know, during Elul, I was saying that every single day, you know, we blow shofar. So we still use these, you know, incredible ancient technologies to announce things. And, and that's a big part of Rosh Hashanah is a, what's called the shofar service and the blowing of the shofar a hundred times to really announce like, wake up, wake up, wake up. It's a new year. I, I hear it in the mornings when I walk my dogs. <clears throat> yes, yes. Every morning during the month of Elul, except for Shabbat, you won't hear it on a Saturday morning. Yes, I once had a neighbor. I thought I was blowing shofar rather quietly, but, you know, they resonate. And I once uh, had all my windows closed and all my doors closed. I guess it was a little early in the morning because somebody was screaming, shut up. <laughs> I, guess it, I guess it carries a little more than I had imagined. <laughs> It's not, it's, but it's not a, an obnoxious sound. It's, there's almost a soothing quality in it. It's not supposed to be soothing. There are three different tones. And what you might be hearing is just a tequila, which is just a, but there are okay. actually three different tones. And one of them is indicated, it's really uh, replicating sobbing. It's very, <laughs> so there's like a nine staccato beat and a three staccato beat and a long blow that's called tequila. And this is how it's been for thousands and thousands, for thousands of years. and thousands of years. The traditions, have they, are they still like they were 5,700 plus years ago? No. Well, I mean, originally, of course, there was a temple. Um, yeah. It was the, you know, the, the, the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, so there was a priesthood and the priests carried out 
special services. But when, when the temples were destroyed, and especially the second temple, the genius, I think, of the ancient rabbis was that they said, okay, no, we don't have a temple anymore. So we have to adapt and we have to figure out how to still be who we are in a world without a land because we lost the land of Israel. We were enslaved. We were taken off to first to Babylonia and then later on to Rome. We were dispersed all over the world. What do you do when your culture is destroyed, your language is destroyed, your the center of everything is destroyed? The rabbi said, hey, you, you, every single person, you are responsible for taking this forward. And so your home becomes your temple, your sanctuary, your table becomes your altar, and you are obliged to carry out what a priesthood once did. Uh, not the animal sacrifices, right. but the blowing of the shofar, the marking of time, the keeping of holy days. And the, it changed from sacrificial offerings to prayer. And I think that was incredibly amazing uh, at a time when there was so little hope that Judaism would survive, that anybody would survive, that any of these tr traditions would survive. What actually happened is that everywhere Jews went, People tried their best to keep up the traditions. And so depending on where people went, uh, for example, let's take food. You know, there's the Ashkenaz tradition, the Eastern European tradition. There's the Mizrahi tradition, the, the Jews who ended up in, uh, for example, Persia. There are the, uh, the Jews who ended up in the Sephardic world, who ended up in Spain and Portugal. And then, of course, a lot of them made their way to the New World. And eventually, Ashkenaz made their way to the New World. So people developed special foods, special customs. Uh, and Rosh Hashanah, one of the great, uh, one of the great things about Rosh Hashanah is that after the morning service on the first day, um, you gather usually together with your family and have a blowout, wonderful New Year's dinner, you know, with a lot of traditional foods. So our challah that we bake, you know, the bread that we bake, uh, for the new year, it becomes round and some people put raisins in it and some people put apples and honey in it. And we eat apples and honey. We dip apples in honey for like hurt your teeth sweetness, you know. So we say, may this be a sweet new year for you. And we have a lot of uh, traditions that have to do with how do you communicate these ideas in a very visceral way, a way that a way that people will understand and a way that people will adopt as part of their their family life. And then they, too, will carry these things on. So, yes, a lot of people go to synagogue, um, but a lot of people go home afterwards and have a big family gathering and big get together. And that's been one of the great losses over the last year and a half for people is the the inability to gather in, in big groups and and do these things together but people have had their passover seders on zoom people have done rosh hashanah and yom kippur on zoom and people have just done their best as it's not new to to the jewish world to pivot really fast and right. have to adapt so um it's been kind of beautiful and remarkable and we can't wait for it to be over <laughs> <laughs> 